Good morning, everybody. Um, colleagues, uh, faculty, and students of the Asia Europe Institute of the University of Malaya. Um, it is indeed my pleasure and great honor to deliver this lecture to you on Malaysia's national role conceptions and transitions of foreign policy from Tunku to Mahade. Uh, I would first like to thank um, uh, Associate Professor Jaswan Singh for the Director of AEI for making this possible. And I would also like to thank uh, Assistant Registrar Alexander, Mr. Alexander Lewis Sami uh, for uh, giving us the, uh, your, you know, the, the, the correct uh, way to present this. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Johan uh, Saravanamutu. I am a Professor Emeritus of uh, University, University Science Malaysia. I'm also adjunct professor at AEI and uh, adjunct senior fellow at the Malaysia Studies Program of the Red Aratum School of International Studies at Nanyang Technological University. Uh, this paper has been actually uh, the work uh, of uh, myself and my two core researchers from RSIS, whose names are Eugene Mark and Nawaljit Singh, uh, who helped me to research uh, the, the paper. Uh, which is now currently a working paper, so I'm presenting you some of our, uh, our findings. Uh, but however, I would uh, you know, hasten to add that they should not be held responsible for the arguments uh, that I make today, or the omissions, or whatever mistakes may be presented uh, in this current lecture. So uh, let me, without further ado, uh, begin by uh, sharing with you my uh, my overview of the lecture, uh, the lecture is here, uh, with, uh, in, a, in a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, so this is the uh, overall lecture. And this is the overview of the lecture. There are a few points here, which I will just read to you. So most of the time you will be seeing me at the side here. Uh, and uh, you know, you will be seeing the PowerPoint uh, as I speak through the PowerPoint. I hope that's okay with you. So this lecture highlights uh, national role conceptions uh, and, our, and NRCs uh, during the Tunku's period of 1957 to 1968 and the first and second Mahade tenures of 1981 to uh, 2003 and 2018 to 2020 respectively. Malaysia's foreign policy and its fundamentals have remained reason reasonably stable, I would argue, over prolonged uh, periods, but NRCs, not NCRs, yeah, uh, which define national foreign policy, uh, foreign policy, have witnessed shifting nuances and changes under different premierships. Uh, Malaysia's foreign policy basically articulated within the constraints uh, posed by a global uh, reg and regional environment and that of a highly politicized and often, uh, the, uh, often divided uh, political domestic landscape, I would argue. In the Tunku era, Malaysia was decidedly a Western ally. Uh, so its role conception was that of a pro-West uh, country uh, and an anti-communist one. Uh, these were very prominent uh, during the Tunku period. Since then, uh, Mahathir's relations with major powers and relationships with uh, relationships with regional countries have shown major shifts and a stable movement towards neutral non-aligned stances emerging as a regional uh, player and a neutral strategist under the premierships of uh, Hun Razak and, and Mahade Mohammed, I would argue. So NRCs under Mahade, um, such as Global Champion of the South, Example of Looking East, Champion of Moderate Islam, I would say were not just outcomes of elite preferences, although they were conceptualized by prime ministers or elites, but they reflected political agendas as well of the elites within what I would call a domestic political game. And I will say more about this as we, as we move on. And domestic contestations or NRCs and foreign policy of course, even have caused the redefinition and the abandonment of some policy directions uh, which were not consonant with the imperatives of this domestic political game. So let me move on to my next slide, which is to give you the, uh, you know, to give you a little uh, of a sense of what national role conceptions are in foreign policy analysis. Uh, 
this idea of national road conception was uh, first propounded by Cal J. Holstein, a very famous uh, international relations scholar from the University of British Columbia, where I got my PhD. In fact, I was his student and uh, I'm privy to some of his ideas about this. Uh, and uh, his idea was basically to look at uh, you know, the, the dependent variable as well as the independent variable side of foreign policy, which uh, in his mind was not very well defined. So natural conceptions can be taken uh, to be the, on the dependent variable side or what we call the output side of foreign policy as definitive markers of foreign policy of any country and on the independent side or the input side uh, as national leanings that would drive certain state policy. So if you're familiar with social science theory, uh, you know, the dependent side is the definition is foreign policy itself. The independent side are the, are the factors which affect foreign policy. So Hosty defines the national role conceptions as the policies, make policy makers uh, definitions of the general kinds of decisions, commitments, rules and actions suitable to their state in the international or regional systems in which they function. So you have the article below, uh, the specific article that he wrote uh, very far back in time, actually in 1970, was still highly relevant, uh, published in the International Studies Quarterly. And there have been, uh, you know, various studies of uh, uh, national law conceptions. But before I go into those studies, let me show you my understanding of, uh, let me just give you my understanding of, of national law conceptions. And I've um, adapted a schema which I used in my book uh, on Malaysia's foreign policy, the first 50 years, published by ISIS in 2010. Uh, this schema I have there, but I don't have the notion of national role conceptions in it. However, I've inserted the idea now into the output side of foreign policy, basically. Uh, so let me just very briefly explain what this, what this means. Uh, I think you can see uh, diagrammatically that uh, foreign policy essentially is, is, is defined by, state, by a, state's a state's identity, a state's uh, its interests and its actual policies, which I have uh, you know, highlighted in my book as foreign policy out outputs, foreign policy objectives, strategies, postures, and actions, which are all foreign policy outputs. However, I've inserted the idea of national role conceptions within this as the intervening variable or factor causing uh, or being a factor that would define uh, these objectives, strategies, postures, and actions, okay? Within the domestic uh, environment, you would have domestic political game. Uh, in my earlier uh, you know, conceptualization, I call it political culture uh, <clears throat> or political uh, you know, space. And you have within this uh, the domestic political space, a political game, role conceptions would therefore be contested or sometimes uncontested within, within this political game. And within that, you would have the idea of a, a state's agency. Uh, how, how, how strong it is able to act uh, externally and even internally vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the kinds of policies that it hopes to uh, enact. Uh, so it varies from high to low, it depends on state society relations, uh, you know, see the arrows going to and fro, and, and then it also depends on, Malaysia, on the country's uh, relations with its external actors, the transnational relations. So this is a nice, uh, neat schema. Uh, to, to, to look at, uh, you know, national role conceptions, but the concept itself, of course, comes from Cal Hosty, not from me. We move on to the next slide, which is to look at the studies that have already been done on, on national role conceptions. There, there are not a whole lot of them, but there are some very interesting ones. And the only study that has been done on Malaysia is by David Han. Uh, David Han, I uh, happen to know him, is a uh, currently pursuing his PhD. He was a senior lecturer or senior analyst actually within the RSIS uh, program, uh, Malaysia Studies program. So he's written a, a, an article cited here below, Malaysia's foreign policy towards Singapore from Mahadi de Badawi uh, and Najib, uh, a, 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 a role theory assessment where he sees uh, the Abdali, Abdullah Badawi and the Najib Razak periods as reenactments of the senior junior role which was found in the Mahadev period, he's trying to say, uh, by adding two new role conceptions. 
which he calls important symbiotic uh, partner, vis-a-vis Singapore, and historical and significant other. So a kind of a softer approach to the senior-junior uh, relationship that uh, Mahade had with Singapore, he argues. So that's the only study done on Malaysia's uh, national conception. So our study now is the one that looks at a broader, you know, larger perspective of all the premiers. Uh, but in, in this particular paper, on this particular lecture, I'm focusing on and the Tunku and some part of Tun Raza and, and the Mahade periods. So if we move on to a couple of other studies that have been done, <coughs> You have the study done by, um, to, uh, by Eileen Gerzel, uh, which is on Turkey. Uh, Turkey's role as a regional and global player and its power capacity. And essentially, it sees um, Turkey's role conceptions in terms of uh, Turkey as a natural leader of the region, a regional power, a big brother, and a protector of Muslim minorities. So you can see as a, as a Muslim nation, uh, Turkey had that kind of role, and Malaysia is also a predominantly Muslim country. Uh, it has some of those aspects uh, of role conceptions in its foreign policy as well. So there is a, rela- uh, there is a relevance of this study to Malaysia. And Karim's uh, study here below, uh, Mok Faisal Karim, is a study of uh, South Korea and Indonesia. Um, and it sees uh, these two countries as, as middle power, status seeking uh, a middle power and therefore uh, with its role conception uh, as middle powers, right? So Karim delves into the role conception of uh, Indonesia and, and, and Korea as middle powers. Uh, again, uh, relevance to Malaysia, I've argued that Malaysia is, is perhaps an aspiring middle power. It certainly has uh, events, uh, middle powership as statecraft, so there are certain sort of uh, elements of Malaysia's uh, statecraft, uh, which can be considered to be middle power statecraft. This has also been pointed out by a writer called Jonathan Thing and several other writers, uh, Nozzle and Stubbs, all of which I have uh, you know, indicated in my book. Okay, so we move on now to uh, <clears throat> the, the, the meat or the uh, substance of this uh, lecture, which is to look at the periods of the Tunku, and then uh, after that, uh, we will look at Mahade. So we'll start with Malaysia's national role conceptions and transitions of uh, foreign policy, which are the most significant transitions, I would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, o- 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 over this long period, well, over the, the, the whole sort of, uh, uh, so far, I mean, in, in terms of foreign policy. So under the Tunku, Malay or Malaysia stood out very clearly as a Western ally. Uh, with national role conceptions displaying explicit pro-Western anti-communist orientations. Uh, this, was not, uh, this was rather clear. I don't, think I, do, I don't think I need to actually go into any detail uh, in delineating these, uh, these uh, role conceptions. But I'd like to point out that by 1968, there was something called the Ismail Peace Plan, which was indicative of a new change taking place in the role conception character, which characterized Malaysia uh, a national role conception which began to characterize Malaysia as a regional and a neutral player. Uh, so while the Tunku was a Western ally, well, while the role conception of Malaysia and the Tunku was that of a Western ally, Malaysia sort of perceptibly shifted uh, by the end of the 60s. Uh, and I would argue that this was the result of a kind of internal contestation which may not have been too evident then, but increasingly now we recognize it that, uh, that, that it was such a case, uh, this was a case, this was such a case, and uh, that a counter elite actually emerged uh, after, particularly after 1969 May Rise, as we all know. Uh, it was under the leadership of Tun Razak, uh, and foreign, foreign policy palpably shifted uh, due, due to this uh, internal contestation that had taken place, and also due to the kind of the changes that, that were already occurring uh, externally. Uh, in the Malaysian <clears throat> regional and, and global environment, uh, which in a sense also changed the kind of uh, domestic uh, political game that was going on within, within Malaysia. <clears throat> so the agential power of a political elite, I would argue, <clears throat> in foreign policy is demonstrated by these transitions that took place uh, under the Tunku. Uh, it's ultimately constrained by, by the political game and domestic political forces 
uh, and societal forces which constitute a political, a political culture under which various political actors play out their preferences <coughs> excuse me, in such a game. <coughs> For the notion of this uh, domestic political game in the literature, we have the article by uh, Christian Cantor and Juliet Carbo, which I have consulted, Contested Roads in Domestic Politics, Reflection on the Role Theory, and so it specifically deals with role theory or national role conceptions. Um, so uh, I would maybe just um, move on now uh, to the uh, second part of the paper, in the interest of time. And that is to look at the uh, national role conceptions under the Mahade periods. So, so let's start with the first Mahade period. So clearly, um, shifts have taken place under, un, under Raza. So now we fast forward uh, to the Mahade period. So the Mahade period did not specifically or did not fundamentally change Malaysia's foreign policy in terms of its non-aligned status, uh, you know, its, uh, its overall sort of stances as a regional player, as a regional strategist. But however, Mahade did add many new sort of dimensions to, uh, to foreign policy, and I would argue uh, new national role conceptions as well. And this was embedded within uh, what I would call <clears throat> a counter-hegemonic discourse or narrative of anti-West uh, stances or anti-Western stances. And South-South cooperation, a stronger orientation towards South-South uh, 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 you know, <coughs> collaborations. And included, of course, the uh, idea of being a regional strategist using middle powership uh, as its uh, policy. And uh, importantly, an exemplar of looking East, a kind of Asian perspective, you might say, a national conception, and of course, uh, very importantly, uh, being a champion of uh, what we can call moderate Islam uh, in the global context. So the Muslim world and CR was the handle, uh, NRC, sorry, was the handle for Mahade in his various uh, stances vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, say, <clears throat> the Palestinian uh, uh, situation, his anti-Zionist stances against Israel, and his chastising of the Western world for its double standards. So you can see that that's, that national conception, the various national conceptions that Mahade had were, were, cons, were considerably new uh, in, the, in, in Malaysia's uh, foreign policy. He was an iconoclastic uh, you know, foreign policy, uh, you know, uh, prime minister, as I've written before. Mahade's foreign policy served, however, a domestic political purpose. And this is not often recognized. Uh, and his use of Asian values in particular, uh, the narrative of Asian values, was a counter-hegemonic trope to reject both Westernism and to delegitimize American or Western models uh, and practices. Uh, so let me just read you something that I've written here uh, in terms of the, uh, yeah, okay. In terms of this kind of uh, approach that Mahade had, right? In the first period, huh? Probably also true in the second period, but let me just read you what I've written here. Uh, I would suggest that Mahathir's NRCs were neatly locked into the domestic political game. Uh, that his, um, that his um, anti-Western rhetoric and pro-Islam postures set very well with a predominant Malay Muslim political constituency. The primacy of economics in Mahade's foreign policy also served a domestic purpose and he used the Asian values narrative as a counter hegemonic trope to reject Westernism, as I, put it, as I put it here, in the larger sense and neoliberalism of the global order as well. To ideologically delegitimize, I'm quoting here from a writer uh, by the name of uh, international relations scholar by the name of Helen E. Nasadurai. I think she's with uh, Monash. Uh, she writes that to ideologically delegitimize American and Western models and practices of human rights and liberal democracy, while also helping to legitimize the interventionist approach to economic development based on communitarian end goals rather than the maximization of individual 
self-interest. So you can see a very interesting national rule conception that Mahade had put on the table and in, in, under his administration. Now, <clears throat> I'm afraid we have to now fast forward. Uh, we, we, are, we are leaving out the, <laughs> uh, we are leaving out the Abdullah Badawi and the Najib periods uh, for now. Uh, otherwise, I will, I, will, I will have to speak till the, uh, till the evening. <laughs> It'll be a very long lecture. Uh, anyway, um, it has not been written up. So basically, the focus is on Mahade 2.0, 2.1, and 2.0. Uh, so let me now just delve very quickly uh, and, and briefly into the shorter tenure of Mahade, which is equally important, I would argue, because it leads us to the current uh, situation today. Uh, in the second tenure of Mahade, uh, from 2018 to 2020, uh, he maintained the early, earlier NRCs, I uh, would argue. However, he did add the role of a maritime nation. As you know, we have, uh, Malaysia had a uh, defense white paper, and in that defense, defense white paper, uh, just recently published, uh, uh, you know, under the PH government, uh, Malaysia was, uh, was, was uh, conceptualized. Uh, under this paper as a national, uh, as a maritime nation, and this is, would be then seen as part of a national role conception that has emerged. Uh, of course, Malaysia was always, uh, in, in a sense, a maritime nation, but in terms of a role conception, this became very clear. And this was actually with, with, uh, with a view to looking at Malaysia's uh, location within, within its uh, strategic location, with, as, you know, within the Straits of Malacca on one side, and the South China Sea on the other side. So I don't really have too much time to get into the details of this, but I think you sort of get the sense of it. Uh, this is a national conception that emerged. Looking East also has been revived. Mahade you know, clearly uh, made visits to Japan immediately on resuming his, uh, uh, his role as prime minister. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, there's some suggestions that he wanted to have a third national car as well. Uh, <clears throat> maybe with Japan, uh, you know, uh, helping along. Uh, but the idea of looking east now maybe could be expanded to the idea of uh, the east as a larger kind of canvas, including a rising China. And of course, China loomed large uh, within, uh, within foreign policy in this second phase of Mahade. Again, uh, not much, I uh, cannot go into great detail. There was a period during the election, electoral campaign where Mahade looked uh, to, to, to China as, uh, as a power that could, have, that could be compromising Malaysia's sovereignty. But when Mahade assumed the reins of power, uh, there was a clear collaboration with China in terms of uh, continuing with the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the ECRL project, and so on. So um, <clears throat> the rising China was also factored into, I think, this national role conception uh, of Mahade in this period. Uh, Mahade 2.0 also witnessed uh, novel approaches uh, and tweaks uh, in role conceptions of championing moderate uh, Muslim causes, uh, world causes, its role as a regional neutral strategist, uh, particularly in a multipolar world in which hedge diplomacy was, uh, was increasingly being practiced. And finally, uh, there was a shift towards a stronger human rights stance, which was again in the Mahade period, um, uh, which is basically more of a PH uh, government strategy or PH government stance. Uh, but that saw intense domestic contestation and protests and saw Malaysia actually abandoning, abandoning its uh, intended ratification or signing of the United Nations uh, International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Uh, and the Rome Statute, which uh, has sanctioned the uh, creation of the International Criminal Court. Uh, these are two, uh, two things which are abandoned in the Mahade period. But I will go into greater detail here because this, uh, you know, locks, this actually uh, feeds into my idea of the domestic political game. Okay, <clears throat> which is uh, now the next slide, right? So Mahade's uh, domestic political game. Now, uh, we have said that uh, earlier on that, uh, you know, in his first period, it was very much locked into his uh, view of, uh, you know, Malaysia as a newly developing, industrializing country, NIC, uh, and I see, and, and the look policy and all those kinds of role conceptions were locked into this. Uh, 
uh, and also in, in a sense, uh, his iconoclastic, uh, you know, policies you see with the West and not accepting Western models uh, and so on. Um, again, it's also part and parcel of this the second uh, phase uh, where Mahadev's world, uh, Muslim world, national role conception of ch championing co-religionist uh, religion causes or co-religionist causes uh, dovetail into the domestic political game as well. Uh, it, and in fact, I would refer you to the, uh, to the idea uh, that there was, uh, sorry, I'll go back here. Yeah. Mahathir, yeah, sorry. The, the, the idea of the domestic political game within um, the Islam worldview uh, is very heavily uh, analyzed by Shanti Nai in the book Islam uh, in Malaysia's Foreign Policy, uh, published uh, quite a long time ago, but very, very relevant even up to today, where Islam was uh, the, the Islam that was used by Mahathir was constituted as so called right Islam or moderate Islam in contrast to wrong Islam or extreme Islam which was attributed to the government's external uh, opponents and even its internal opponents, uh, which at some points of time was thought to be uh, the Islamic party past. The other sort of aspect was, of course, Mahadi's continued uh, uh, persistent and aggressive pro-Palestinian uh, anti-Zionist uh, you know, policies um, uh, and it's his attempt uh, in this role conception to elevate uh, Malaysia's uh, role as as uh, as you know uh, championing the cause of Muslim soft power, you might say, uh, and that sat very well uh, with Malaysia's predominant uh, Muslim constituency. So this trope uh, continued uh, in, in in 19. Uh, let me say, let, let me give you an example. Uh, the KL summit of December 19 <coughs> of 2019, initiated by Mahade under the PH government. Um, <coughs> this was a proposal of a KL summit. <coughs> the, KL, the proposal of KL summit came up when he met Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan at the sidelines of the United Nations uh, General Assembly of the 74th uh, UN uh, General Assembly. And Mahade uh, suggested that the conference would grow into a grander initiative down the road uh, and it would actually challenge, uh, well, it was, could potentially challenge the influence of the, the OIC in the Muslim world. So, um, <clears throat> as chair of the OIC, Saudi Arabia was clearly not very pleased with Mahadi's organization of the summit. However, behind closed doors, Malaysia had to explain to the Saudi government it wasn't competing for influence in the Muslim world. Uh, and that, that as a small state, uh, they, you know, it was just initiating a program which would help to raise consciousness about Muslim causes. And the two causes that were of particular concern uh, in this particular period of time was, of course, the Rohingya issue, as well, of course, the increasing problems with Palestine. So again, uh, <clears throat> again, part of this general sort of uh, policy uh, continued uh, within uh, the Mahade second period. Now, I like to then go into this issue of the, of the uh, domestic political gain and policy uh, disruption. Uh, <clears throat> so policy disruption vis-a-vis -vis the domestic, uh, with the vis -vis foreign policy can be viewed this way. The PH government's uh, new NRC of championing human rights uh, through ratifying the UN ICER and the Rome Statute met with huge contestations and street protests, particularly, especially by Malay Muslims. Um, <clears throat> a, a rally of, 50, uh, of 55,000 people was held in the heart of Kuala Lumpur on the 8th of December, 2020. And this was sanctioned by PAS and UMNO. In fact, they called for half a million people to you know, attend, but in the end, there was only 55,000. Uh, and in the speeches that were made, pledges and so on, they were called you know, upheld, call for Malaysia to uphold the sanctity of Islam and Malay rights. And it saw that Malaysia's signing of the International Convention of the International Operation of Discrimination somehow seemed to be an affront to this thing. Uh, 
uh, to these uh, sort of uh, goals of Malaysia or these kinds of uh, <coughs> sensibilities or sensitivities of Malaysian politics. So the ICED uh, was in fact rescinded early in the day in November 2018, even before the, the, uh, the protest was held. And the Rome Statute was finally scuttled. Uh, the idea of signing the Rome Statute was finally scuttled in April of 20, 2019, right? Okay, so we move on. Basically to my conclusion now. Uh, and uh, I would say that uh, Malaysia has entered into an unprecedented uh, political landscape uh, of highly fractious politics where internal uh, political contestations can disrupt any new foreign policy uh, direction or directions which are not in step uh, with, the internal, uh, with the internal politics or the internal political game. Uh, so political contestations can disrupt any new foreign policy, you know. Uh, although this, I would quickly hasten to add, doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't happen very often. So Malaysian foreign policy fundamentally has remained about the same since the period of Tun Razak until now. There have been all these new conceptions, novel ideas in the Mahade period, of course, and many of these ideas also have remained in place, but certain kinds of newer conceptions, which are not in keeping with this domestic political game, however, have been abandoned. So this is the, the these are the, the, this particular one uh, is an example of it. The failure to ratify the treaties of ISA and the Rome Statute. Um, the fundamentals of Malaysian foreign policy have basically remained the same, and I would end by just reading you at the conclusion of my paper, five points. So the fundamentals that are unlikely to be changed uh, in Malaysia's foreign policy, including its national conceptions within those fundamentals, will be the following. First, Malaysia would likely continue to practice non-alignment and be friendly to all countries, with the exception of Israel, which uh, doesn't have diplomatic relations with Malaysia. Second, the Islamic agenda of Malaysia's uh, foreign policy has always been present and will not go away, regardless of the changes in domestic politics. And thus, its Muslim world orientation will definitely remain in place for some time to come. Third, the South China Sea will continue to be a security focus for Malaysia, which is now uh, thought to be a maritime nation uh, in terms of its role conception. This will loom large in the future, given the kinds of uh, regional politics that has now emerged, uh, strategic questions around this, uh, that have now emerged in the South China Sea. Fourth, Malaysia will continue to maintain its hedge diplomacy and middle powership, which is part of that hedge diplomacy, vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis US, uh, Japan, Australia, South Korea, and India uh, in the expanded Indo-Pacific uh, area, what used to be called the Asia-Pacific region. Fifth, Malaysia under any new government would continue to further economic diplomacy in ASEAN and as well as political uh, diplomacy as a regional strategist. That will not change. However, despite these fundamentals remaining in Malaysia's foreign policy, the current preoccupation with the COVID-19 pandemic, in fact, the importance of this pandemic will mean that foreign policy as a whole is likely to take a back seat. And there will be few, if any, new global conceptions in the near future. Moreover, internal contestations in decision-making will persist given that the Malaysian political landscape has now become highly divisive. So, well, ladies and gentlemen, that would be the end of my lecture. Uh, it remains for me to, uh, again, uh, thank uh, the Executive Director of AEI, Dr. Jaswan Singh, for having, having given me the opportunity to share my thoughts with you uh, on the subject of national role conceptions in Malaysia's uh, foreign policy. Of course, I would also like to gratefully acknowledge yet again uh, the work that has put in by Mr. Nawaljit Singh and Mr. Eugene Mark, who are my co-conspirators, my co-researchers uh, in, in this project. Uh, I hope uh, the lecture has been useful for, for AEI students.
uh, and I hope they will share it with uh, their colleagues. And anyone, any one of you would please feel share, uh, please feel free to share this uh, when it's posted on the on the web uh, for people who might be interested in this sort of thing. I apologize for not being able to be present physically uh, given the current situation, uh, but I hope uh, this will be a substitute for not being present physically. So, uh, a very good day to all of you. Goodbye.